Our investigation did not end here. Unsolved History decided to analyze the film of Orville Nix. Three-dimensional imaging shows us his exact camera angle, which gave him a clear view of the grassy knoll. We asked Dallas cinematographer Steve McWilliams to reshoot the Nix film in order to see what Nix could and should have captured. Replicate with the film stocks that we have today and uh, see if we can expose and, and get an image similar to what he had that day. Orville Nix made a key mistake on that November afternoon. He used an indoor film stock outdoors, then forgot to use a correcting filter. The result was a film with dark shadows, obscuring any details of the grassy knoll. This is Pretty an 8 millimeter. This is called double 8. What would history look like if he had used the right film stock and the right camera settings? First, we put our mock gunman back on the grassy knoll, and then, Using a vintage 8mm camera, we reshot the Nix film the correct way. Next, we took it to a transfer facility to enhance and enlarge it. Today, we have sophisticated enhancement techniques that were unavailable in 1963. But could more have been seen had the Nix film been shot correctly? Would we now be able to see the detail in the shadows of the grassy knoll that the original lacked? By overexposing the film and being able to look into the shadow area. Look at that. Yeah, there's a, you there's can start a person to see. standing there. You can, you can see it. There's still areas, though, that I look at and I go, is that a person or a shadow? And I was there shooting it. And, uh, it's it's hard to know, but I think when you do run the the film in motion, right. um, you do see uh, more information. You can get some uh, additional information. Again, the more you examine the circumstances of the Kennedy assassination, the more one realizes why it continues to be such a mystery. Had Orville Nix just operated his camera properly, he may have captured what was going on in the shadows of the grassy knoll. Unfortunately for history, and perhaps fortunately for a hidden gunman, Nix used the wrong film without a correcting filter. But Nix did capture something. Can you stop it right there? What's interesting is, uh, even in these dark shadows, you can see Abraham Sapruder and his receptionist standing as he's filming, uh, obviously, his very famous footage. But even with them in dark clothes, the flesh tones come out. Fortunately for history, one man was in the right place, with the right equipment, and filmed for the right amount of time. His name was Abraham Sapruder. The sequence of deadly events that took place in Dallas's Dealey Plaza on November 22nd, 1963, began with a right turn and ended with a tragedy. Was John Kennedy murdered by one sniper aiming out of a six-floor window? Or was Kennedy the victim of a sophisticated hit team operating elsewhere in Dealey Plaza? No matter what you believe, there is one home movie that documents the assassination in horrifying detail. But as with so much surrounding this story, those details have been debated. This much is certain. Abraham Sabruder worked in the Daltex building across the street from the book depository. Anxious to take pictures of his favorite president, he wandered onto the plaza and selected this elevated vantage point for his filming location. You can walk around Dealey Plaza today looking for a better spot and you probably won't find one. That one was perfect. He was above the crowd. He had a sweeping view. He planned it all. He carried an 8mm Bell & Howell zoom camera loaded with Kodachrome 2 film. Zabruder can be seen in this Phil Willis photograph his receptionist, Marilyn Sitzman, steadying him on the cement pedestal. 
Filming for just over 26 seconds, Sepruder was the only photographer to capture the entire assassination sequence. I had a shot, and they uh, slumped to the side like this. Then I had another shot or two. I couldn't say what it was, one or two. And I saw his head practically open up, all blood and everything, and I kept on shooting. Sepruder took his film to this Dallas Kodak lab near Love Field. Phil Chamberlain still remembers the first screening. The reaction of the people in the room was generally that of being stunned. You could hear intake of breath and look at that and sobs, and particularly the frame where Kennedy's head literally exploded. Uh, you could hear a sudden intake of breath of people as they watched it. We can now tie the Sap Bruder film into our timeline of Dealey Plaza photography and see the small details that transport us back in time. And the president is just now reaching the Dealey Plaza. As you go down Elm Street, the crowds get thinner and thinner and thinner. Up in the back, you can see uh, wearing that blue skirt is uh, Tina Towner and her mother and father, so they're waiting. And Zapruder is filming because he doesn't know what to expect. And the first car he sees that looks like it might have the president, he starts filming. You can see Willis there, he's actually in the street. He's taking a picture right there. And of course the motorcycles are real close, so he's gonna step back. And Willis is winding his camera right now and is about to take an, his next picture, which he always said was as a result of hearing the first shot. It startled him. And he's gonna take his picture uh, right about here. As the car continues down the street, we'll see the woman called the babushka lady. But as you can see, there's a man standing in front of her. So it's hard to say what her film might or might not show because there's a head blocking her view. And now coming into the frame is Jean Hill. And there's Mary Mormon with her Polaroid camera. She can't quite see Kennedy because his head is blocked from her view by Jackie. But now she gets a view of Kennedy's head and she's about to take her picture and click. That's the moment of the fatal shot. Gary, this is just moments after the assassination. And look at these two individuals. I never noticed that before. Yeah, they're running east. They're running away. Seconds earlier when the shooting was going on, they were directly in the line of fire, at least from the building. So they're now running to get out of the line of fire. And here's the limousine that's going into the triple underpass. Zapruder is about ready to stop filming. But. Had he kept turning just slightly, this is the view he would have had of the grassy knoll and the fence where some believe a second shooter was crouching. You know, Gary, if he had just panned one more inch, he could have captured that stockade fence and that inch could have changed history. He might have answered all the questions, but he could have raised a lot more. With the Sapruder film in place, Unsolved History can now return to November 22nd, 1963 at 12.30 p.m., the moment when the presidential motorcade turned into Dealey Plaza. John Kennedy's deadly ride through Dealey Plaza lasted only 45 seconds. Virtually every second was captured by a camera somewhere. Gary, now that you see the photos in their point of view, what does this tell you? Well, it's impressive to see it graphically like this, to see how much area in Dealey Plaza was actually covered by films and photographs. What a unique opportunity to go back in time through the computer to try and figure out what happened. Our final reconstruction leads us to some interesting conclusions. First, much of Dealey Plaza was photographically covered during the critical 45 seconds. But the two prime locations where the fatal shots could have come from were not properly documented. The grassy knoll was either missed because a camera did not pan or because the photography was too indistinct. The sixth floor window was photographed earlier but not at the time of the shooting. And what about the areas that were not surveyed by our photographic mosaic? 
These include the Dow Tex building, the West Side windows in the Texas School Book Depository, and the top floors of the County Records building. All would have afforded a sniper a clean shot. But, no matter what direction the bullet came from, the fatal shot was captured on film. And we warn you, that scene is horrific. What sometimes is lost in this is this is a murder of a human being, our leader. When people study the film, I mean, you have to filter out what's really going on, because otherwise you have to stop and think about what all this means. Now, as it happened, the tragedy in Dallas. At precisely 12.30 p.m., the presidential limo turns into Dealey Plaza. Holding these cameras, a handful of people went to Dealey Plaza on a sunny November day. The images they captured still haunt us. The Kennedy assassination photography is a double-edged sword, so to speak, in that the pictures answer a lot of questions. But sure enough, every time you look at them, you find more questions. I look at it as like a jigsaw puzzle. When it's spread out all over the floor, you can't tell what it is. But when you put enough of the pieces together, you get the picture. And I think that's what will happen with this case. But looking at how well Dealey Plaza was documented that day, there is one inescapable conclusion. If there was a conspiracy and multiple gunmen, then not only was it brilliantly executed, but the members were unbelievably lucky. They and their shots have evaded capture for 40 years. Perhaps somewhere, in some trunk, in some roll of film, an image exists that might provide this last piece of the puzzle. Meanwhile, these photographs stand as a memorial to a time when a president could ride through sunlit streets in an open car. A journey where the final destination was immortality. The images of the assassination are significant because they act as a time traveler. They take us back to November 22nd, 1963, but we can't stop the film. And so we witness the cruelty and the obscene murder of a president. And we're haunted by it even to this day.